my name is Andrew Bauer, and uh, I work uh, with Inder up until actually earlier this week. Inder is, uh, works on the web team at Boston University, and I've worked with them there for about three years. We're going to tell you a little bit about how WordPress runs at Boston University and how we've scaled it out to the whole campus there and how users kind of consume it on a daily basis, both from an organizational side of how that stuff was implemented and the technical side of how that day-to-day -day operation gets run. So it's a little bit of something for everybody there. Our talk is called WordPress as a Service, WPAAS, a Centralized Approach to Managing WordPress at Boston University. You can give us a shout out on Twitter. Uh, come find us if you have any questions. Uh, we'll take them on there too. Always happy to answer questions. So let's, let's get into it here. WordPress at, at Boston University, it's a large-scale, multi-site, multi-network installation. All of our highest traffic properties are on WordPress at BU, which we found is, is kind of rare for uh, a lot of institutions across the board. 8 to 10 million page views per month across all of our about 7,000 sites, or 6,300 sites, sorry about that. Uh, it's deeply integrated with our campus services, with single sign-on, with security, with profiles, content restriction, calendar, all that sort of stuff. All integrated right with WordPress. And what we found at some universities is it's, it's kind of rare to see it implemented through central IT. Our department is called IST, and we're the ones that manage the WordPress platform. And it's actually just one of the options that people have when putting a site out at BU. They can go, they can spin up their own server, they can host it themselves. That's a completely viable option, but people are choosing in uh, boatloads to come and use our WordPress installation it's, it's completely by choice, though. They could, they could do it by themselves if they wanted to. Um, and at BU, we actually refer to the people that consume our, our services as clients. And, and that's you'll hear that further in our talk. But when we say clients, these are the, the academic departments and the different sections of the university that use WordPress that we're referring to. So let's get started. We found kind of three really big components of a great WordPress installation. Any, any really great enterprise WordPress installation takes into account the organizational side of things, the technical side of things, and the people side. Because those three all really can kind of have different needs at the end of the day. From the organizational side, some questions to ask are kind of how does WordPress fit into our organization? What do we want from it? What do we really need? And um, what kind of approach is best for us? Is it a centrally managed approach where it would be through central IT? Or is it more of a uh, independent integration where you have each department in each academic area kind of running their own WordPress installation. Then in the long term questions about those kind of integrations like is that something that's sustainable in terms of upgrades and security uh, or would a central approach be really more beneficial to us in that regard. From the technical side of course you need to take into consideration things like hosting, things like management and what kind of architecture WordPress itself is going to live on and where will it live on premises or in the cloud. Those are all really important things to take into consideration before you kind of dive into this centralized approach to WordPress. And the people side of it is equally important and, and not to be forgotten is who will be using these services both from the website consumer side and from the academic consumer side. So who will be doing the content and managing the content, who will be uh, administering the day to day in terms of adding users and what requirements do they have? What kind of workflows do they we need to take account for in terms of publishing content and, and that sort of thing too? And once you've taken into consideration all three of these things, they come together for a really great WordPress installation and a really positive experience across the board. So the SaaS thing, what, what is software as a service? It, it's, it's kind of a buzzword. Everybody has a little bit of a different definition here. But there's a few key things that it always boils down to. It's always going to be an application. It's always going to be something that, that gets run somewhere. Um, and when you're doing it as a software as a service, it's going to be hosted centrally. So it's going to be run one place, and it's going to be managed by one group of people. And that's going to take a lot of the headache out of it for your clients, for the people that are consuming it. In terms of WordPress, at least, they're not going to have to deal with upgrades. They're not going to have to deal with security issues. It's something that gets managed by, in this case, central IT, IST department. For our clients, that ends up being a really turnkey solution. It's something that they can just show up on and publish, which really, at the end of the day, is the goal of WordPress, to have a really great publishing platform. So WordPress itself, why is it such a great fit for the SaaS model? 
it's, it's built for it, really, at its core. When you look at something like multi-site, the ability to add users, to add sites, to share users across a variety of sites in the academic context is a really great fit for the SaaS model. You, as platform administrators, have total control over that environment. You can say which plugins are active and which plugins you're going to support from a security and a lifestyle perspective. And you only have that one place to support. You don't have to manage all these individual fragmented installations across campus. You have that one or maybe two multi-site installations where you do the bulk of your work and that's where the support happens. It's one common thread across the board that you don't have to deal with a dozen different configurations for how things are done. So for higher ed, it, it's really great because it ends up being a service model we know and understand. It's something that isn't foreign to us. It's something we deliver to our clients and it's something they use as a service. It's done through central IT and in a situation like this, central IT is not the enemy. In a lot of cases, it ends up being the people that say no, the people where you have to pull all these strings to get things done. This is not the case when you're running with WordPress because it's so immensely flexible. It, it ends up being something that's more of a, an organizational decision for whether something gets done or not, not a technical restriction on that end of things. And the, the single central integration, we've kind of ended up there because we found that the siloed integrations can be really tricky to support in the long term. You're not updating 100 sites, you're updating one. And that's a really great fit for us because with limited resources, it's not something you have to go do 100 times, you can just do it once. And it gives really clear <clears throat> definitions of support roles. The, the clients know that they're there to consume and we can help facilitate that by keeping the environment restrictive enough that it's not easy to break things you know, across the board, but uh, they know that they're responsible for administering the content and the sort of inside of the site there, and we're responsible for the layer that it kind of runs on. So our, our WordPress platform, from an organizational perspective, is pretty interesting compared to some of the other universities because we want to run a cost recovery model. So when you have the WordPress platform itself is, is a free offering to anybody at the university that wants a site or wants a blog, that sort of thing. But when you want features and enhancements, it's something we can bill on a cost recovery basis for. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more further down. Uh, similar to WordPress.com, people can come, they can request a site, and a few hours later they can have something ready to go. It's just because a lot of that work is handled automatically uh, by multi-site, the, the add new site, that sort of thing. But we facilitated that with some plugins on the back end, and this is an integration with our service desk, uh, support desk, that actually does a lot of the work of getting those, those requests flowing for us, which is great. It takes a lot of the load off of uh, our plates. And so when a client really comes and fills out this and requests a site, they're coming into our platform, and that's the start of a, a kind of new relationship with us and them. They're coming in, and we're the service provider, and they're the, the person that's, that's spinning up their site. As part of that relationship, there's a few bullet points here that we found are really great for ensuring a great relationship there. The first one is to set clear expectations, and, and that's to make sure that they understand this is what's included out of the box in WordPress, this is what's offered for support of those things that are included out of the box, and these are the resources that are really available to you on our platform. Because like I said earlier, it's something they can completely opt into. It's not something that we forced anybody into. They can go use a hosting website that's not ours if they really want to, but with our platform they get all the management, all the support, all the things we just talked about out of the box and freely available. So it's a, it's a really great understanding that this is everything that we can kind of do for you, but this is the stuff that we're going to expect you to kind of work within these guidelines here for the stuff we've offered. So we try and be really transparent about what's available out of the box and what's supported directly by our platform. These are the plugins that we have active and we publish these on uh, the, the BU Tech website and these are available to all of our clients on day one. So they can activate any of these plugins or request to have activated any of these. And when there's something on this list or not something on this list that they wanted, a new plugin, a fancy new feature, it's really easy to say, well, this might not be in the best interest of the platform as a whole because of all the, the different 
uh, ramifications that come with that, the security, the support, and maintenance, because at the end of the day, it's the platform that we administer, the platform that we're responsible for supporting from a security, from an accessibility perspective, and all of those other things. And so, if it ends up being custom development, back to that cost recovery model, we can say this is the fee that comes along with that custom development to get this implemented. Or we can say this might not be the best fit for our platform. We had a client that was looking for a big buddy press installation, and we said this, we can help you, 10 minutes? We can help you get that going, but that's gonna have to be outside of our platform on WordPress engine or something like that. Of this list here, this is everything that we've open sourced, and, and we're very excited about that. And uh, all of the information is available online at bu.edu slash tech, so it's very freely, openly available. I'm sorry, what was that again? bu.edu slash tech. And so, again, that clearly delineating roles for our clients to say this is the, the platform that we're supporting and, and these are the roles that you're going to have as, as content administrators and, and editing content. Very easy to do in WordPress where we can say this is what we're offering you today as part of the platform and we're going to support everything that's offered within there. And our third one here is that it's very important to provide stellar training. We have a whole section of our department that's dedicated to providing training, not just in the context of WordPress, but really it's the group that does training across the university for classroom support and all that other thing, all that other stuff. WordPress is just one of their offerings there. Again, these offerings are all freely available on WordPress or on bu.edu slash tech, and they offer classes throughout the year on, on WordPress 101 and um, all kinds of other areas of WordPress. Our last goal here is really all comes together to deliver a top quality service, and we couldn't do that without our support from marketing and communications. We've built uh, with them a really great uh, responsive foundation theme that lets us have a brand compliant uh, accessible and uh, responsive theme framework we, we can give to our clients and say here use this and it's fully brand compliant it's fully meets all of the standards that you'd expect from us but they can also at the same time customize it to their needs so they can have a really nice look and feel that represents their department with all their colors and everything all their images and we don't have to do any work for that. That's something they can do through Customizer. That's something that's supported directly through WordPress without having to get us involved at all, or marketing and communications. <clears throat> that shared service model has really been a tremendous asset for us. Marketing and communications handles a lot of the themes, the designs, and, and kind of that photography side of things. We handle more of the platform administration side, the plugins, um, really deep technical stuff like API and mobile application development. And it all really comes together for a great WordPress experience for our clients. Inder's going to talk more about how that works on the day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to talk about a little bit from the technical side, um, the development. How do we maintain the SaaS model? And what tools do we use to keep it running? Uh, so I'll give a quick overview of what our environments look like. We have four dedicated environments. There's the prod environment uh, that's mixed with staging. Prod is everything that are live sites, and staging is where content is being staged that will soon become live. Uh, and then there's the test environment for integration testing, devil for developers, and systy for systems testing. So I'll go deeper into each of those environments. In the production environment, we have um, on a server architecture level, we have four load balancers, four app servers that serve WordPress, two database servers, three memcached servers, and that all brings together to serve production and staging at the same time. So production is really a multi-network, multi-domain, multi-site environment. It's a single version of code running to power all the 6,000 websites. Uh, there's lots of MU plugins, must use plugins that we run there. Uh, some of the Popular ones are, common ones are Akismet uh, to do spam protection. There's BU access control, that's something that we've developed to restrict uh, access to pages so that you can restrict a page such that only faculty can access it or students can access it. Um, there's the cache plugin. So we've merged the bat cache plugin uh, that's in the WordPress plugin repository with um, the memcached plugin to sort of service our needs. Uh, we have lots of common plugins that are activated per site on request. Uh, some of the common ones there are BU profiles. 
as, as you can understand, we service a lot of departments and groups at BU, and they all have faculty, staff, or students that they want to list out. So it really allows them to list out a directory kind of a view for their um, group. And then we have BU Custom CSS as a common plugin that we um, have uh, homegrown. Um, so we have BU Custom CSS. This is a plugin uh, that we sort of stripped out of uh, Jetpack. Jetpack is a popular plugin, uh, but it has a lot of other things that we don't really need. So we really took that and um, put it out on GitHub and people can install it. Um, so we have two large theme frameworks. Um, there's responsive framework, as Andrew was talking about before. This is the fully responsive, fully accessible theme. A lot of the themes are child themes of this theme. And it really makes life easier when you update the parent theme, you automatically get those features in the child themes. Um, and then there's the Flexi framework. This is our older framework. Um, back when we were building out individual themes, we noticed that there was a pattern. And this Flexi framework came, came out of that. Um, and there's a lot of custom child themes that um, give the high traffic sites a distinct look in um, differentiating them from the other sites. Um, in the testing environment, uh, we have integration testing happening. So all the new functionality that will eventually get into production must first go through the test environment. And it matches prod really closely, except on the amount of servers that powers it. Um, one tool that really brings this environment together is the clone site tool. Uh, now this is a custom tool that we've developed at BU, but there are alternatives out there, like WP Clone by WP Academy and several others that could do similar work. What, real, what it really allows us to do is duplicate content from production sites into our test environment. And in this test environment, we could run something like WP Debug Bar or Query Monitor to really closely see the problem that we're facing in production. Uh, we also have a BU WebDiff tool that uh, one could use to uh, compare uh, sites in production versus sites in test environment. Uh, what that allows us to do is uh, really, because there's a lot of sites, and if we change the core functionality on any of the sites, uh, this could give you a visual snapshotting and differences between those two sites to easily uh, figure out issues. Uh, Devil, this is the developer's work area. Um, separate networks, separate code for each developer so they don't step onto each other's toes. And uh, a single network for all the designers. Uh, this really helps the designers uh, work on a fast pace uh, at the same time on a single theme and the issues of stepping over each other are sort of low because you're not breaking the entire environment. Uh, designers could really break uh, a single theme at a time while doing that. Uh, the clone side tool again is a valuable tool. You can easily clone over issues from production into our environment um, and test it closely uh, using something like Xdebug. SysT, this is uh, the system, le system level packages are being tested on this environment. The system engineer, server admins are using this environment. They could break it at any time, and they wouldn't be disturbing any of the work that's happening in production, development, or any of the environments. So it really allows them to work independently of us. Uh, so I'll go into some of the tools that we use. WP Deploy, this is... Um, so back in the day, we used to SSH into servers and run git commands and SBN commands to update the code. Now, you can easily miss something that you, know, you really wanted to update on one server versus the others. So we sort of, in those times, we, there wasn't any tools that could really do that. There were libraries, Capistrano, Fabric, and we chose the Fabric library to build this tool. So it's really a build and deployment tool, and we've built a web UI for it. Uh, every deploy gets logged. Anything that gets deployed to production is automatically logged to a GitHub repository, so we can easily rebuild those configurations and install them into our sandboxes, such that we mirror production exactly. Um, it integrates with GitHub really closely to list out branches and tags, and the designers really love it because they can uh, easily use this web UI to deploy. They don't have to get through the uh, command line tools to uh, run these commands. So we use Git heavily here at BU. Um, using Git isn't enough. We've adopted the Git flow branching model. 
this really lists out you know, features and hot fixes and releases in separate places. Um, if you look at the WP API um, GitHub repository, you can really see that it's a mess trying to figure out which one of those is a branch or hot fixes and tags. Uh, so the GitFlow branch at least cleans that up and gives us a process on how features are integrated into the mainline uh, plugin code. So we also use pull requests to uh, peer review changes. When we do a pull request, our notifications automatically come into Slack and some of the other developers can chime in and jump in and offer feedback on any of those changes. We're trying to um, heavily adopt automation into uh, VU. Uh, so we've been adding unit tests to any time we touch any plugin, we have to add a unit test. It could be one single unit test to make sure the plugin just works, but there has to be something there to do that. Um, and we used to take a long time to do upgrades, uh, three to four months. We're aiming to do that within two months, and that's largely because we're choosing to implement unit tests for all of our plugins. We also have New Relic um, as a service that we use at VU. It's a really great service. It has a WordPress integration uh, that allows you to see some of the hooks that are taking a long time, or plugins that are taking a long time, themes that are doing something. Um, we really monitor the overall performance here, and it reports these things into Slack so we can easily see that there are problems happening. And we also use the synthetics uh, feature there to monitor individual pages. This sort of allows you to see that um, the pages are actually outputting uh, important, useful, valuable data rather than just giving a, a 200 status. So Slack is the glue that sort of brings us all together. We have developers, designers working in different buildings, IT team in different buildings, sysadmins, system engineers, all in different buildings, and Slack really brings us all together. So. Even people working remotely, it feels like you're working with them at the same time in the same room. We have channels for each of the large products that we have, and then we have maintenance channels uh, to track new relic alerts or discuss broad changes that are happening. So for example, we have a channel dedicated to HTTPS uh, migration, such that we can all work on that same feature in different plugins or different themes at the same time. We also have channels to discuss outages or broad changes that we have. VU has adopted a cloud strategy to go into AWS. Um, this is, we haven't moved our server architecture to AWS, but we have been testing our open source plugins there to make sure that, because we're still running WordPress 4.1, which is sort of an older version, 4.6 is almost coming up next month. And so we test our open source plugins there um, before we can uh, ship them out so that people aren't facing any of those problems. Uh, we're also testing our plugins with the newer versions of WordPress. So when we do upgrade to the newer version of versions of WordPress, we can make sure that those plugins still work. Finally, WordPress as a service. So some takeaways, we, we'd like to, we hope that we've shown that a centralized SaaS approach to WordPress in higher ed is really a sustainable, scalable model here. And that cross-departmental collaboration is key, like our collaboration with marketing communications. The points here are careful, careful planning to be able to scope out the whole system and really understand how it fits into the organization, both from a people and a technical perspective on, on that side of things. So on the operation side, we want to automate a lot of this stuff, and automation is going to make a life easier. So we can do proactive monitoring of stuff. We can make sure that stuff isn't breaking, and before it's even broken, or when the response times are low, we can add in um, alerts to let us know that something is breaking to take a look at it. And we really want to adopt that all across our workflow. Uh, one of the last points I want to leave you with is um, our clients are choosing WordPress, so they have an option to do static sites. Some of the departments have their own developers that could you know, pretty much launch their own WordPress installs or they can build out their custom websites. But they're choosing to do WordPress as a service, and it's because of all of the work that we put in and all of the service management that we do for WordPress. So this is Andrew Barr. Uh, those are details uh, in their saying, we're hiring. So if somebody's looking for a job, let us know. What kind of jobs? Uh, we have um, design work, 
jobs and um, development as well. PHP. Uh, I'm just a writer. Of blog. Blog. Oh, two blogs actually. We could get in touch with Interactive Design, who have the writers and content editors. Well, I'm just a writer, writer. I just write into the blogs. Really design or develop. You can definitely check out VU's HR uh, job site. If there are jobs in the interactive design side, they would be listed. Could you talk? Could you talk more about the Git workflow? And um, you mentioned, um, uh, I guess it was just Git flow. Yeah. Uh, WP deploy, and just talk more about how that fits in with Git. Yep. So um, Git flow is a branching model. So anytime you're implementing a new feature into one of your plugins or and multiple people are working on the same plugin, they should all be having their own feature branches to do so. Any feature I add in, uh, even if I'm adding two features, I would have different feature branches. And that allows work to happen independently of each other, and you can merge those together. So there is a branching model that you can really follow. Um, it's, it's, very, um, it's very well explained in the sense that you can easily see where branches are being merged and mainline branch, where the mainline branches are. And the other thing is, uh, it has a specific model such that you can have hot fixes in separate branches that can get merged as well. Um, and then the, every release that happens for a plugin must have a release branch where the version updating and readme updating happens. So it's really a way to make sure that the way you're using Git is consistent across the developers and designers. And we can easily see what stuff is happening. Um, uh, and WP Deploy is to get to the other half of that. I don't know how much time we have for questions. But um, that, that's an in-house build tool similar to kind of code ship or something like that. We have a list of, uh, we call them packages. There are themes and plugins and WordPress cores in there too. And that gets deployed. The, the script comes in and, and downloads everything from GitHub, does a checkout, it does the build, and then does a, an SSH with the rsync to get it out on each of the four servers after they've been built. Sort of skipped over this slide, but um, I also want to mention that there's a WP Deploy open source tool by NixD, I think. So our, our tool predates that. We sort of have the uh, authority on the name. But um, <laughs> that, that tool is open source, so they sort of have one up on on that side. Uh, but the tool, with it, what it really allows is you can easily build configurations. You can see that production was at this uh, stage uh, yesterday, and you can rebuild that and deploy it to your own sandbox. And similarly, one of the really cool features is rollback. So sometimes you deploy something and you're like, oh damn, I shouldn't have deployed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so you know, when you hit rollback, we have sim links to the older installs. Rollback is really just similar to the older installs, and it easily switches over, and you're back to your normal state. Let's go to the mic. Hi, you mentioned um, restricting content by user groups, and I was wondering a couple things. First, are you doing that with something like LDAP groups or something to that effect? And also, do you, do you also have a um, sort of an internet portal platform as well, or do you find that this replaces some of that or all of that or? not sure what you mean by internet portal, but... I would say like internal communication stuff, things that are only meant for on-campus groups like, uh, you know, uh, say, HR, rather than having all their internal, like, talk about benefits and stuff like that on a public-facing website. And maybe it's a different model, so, so we have it. Uh, so I'm trying to... Do you... Does that... So there's, there's a bunch of different things uh, there. The sites that use WordPress, HR does use WordPress, and they have a lot of their documents up there behind our access control. So it uses the web log and single sign-on to authenticate people and actually restrict content that's in the WordPress media library. So they can upload a PDF and then restrict it with web login, and so people log in with their BU single sign-on account and can download those documents. That's all hosted within WordPress. There is still SharePoint at the university that just upgraded to Office 365, so they have made a big investment in SharePoint also. There are uh, several teams use Slack and some internal documents that are not even published or are, uh, live on there. So there's sort of a mix of different things, but people do host restricted documents in our WordPress also. And 
It's sort of using web login. It's a authentication authorization um, platform that BU has sort of built. But we're now slowly moving into Shibboleth and CAS to okay. do some of that tasks. Um, and our access control plugin actually interfaces with web login. But hopefully when we do make the switch to Shibboleth, which is an industry-wide standard, uh, we can get away from doing some of that custom stuff. Thanks, cool. like I said, did answer someone else. So we grant site admin to a limited number of, of users, and those have uh, control over their site. So as soon as you log in through WP Admin, you're uh, set up with an account there, and then those admins can add you into a site. So I, I can imagine that this, this way of doing um, you know, a system for a university or college makes the, the larger institution much more literate, you know, across the government tank, from clubs to classes, professors, administrators, especially. Um, I also imagine it's probably a headache for y'all, too, because they're trying to do things. Do you have to come up and clean up things afterwards? I mean, what does that relationship sort of look like? So a student group says, oh, we want to update our page or our site, and something's awry. Do you then, and maybe they don't know it, maybe they come to you, but probably you have the proficiency to go back and fix it. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that relationship and pitfalls as well as uh, sort of celebrations. So it's it's usually a mix of kind of training, and I would have hit on these more if we had more time, but um, it's usually a mix of, of training and kind of uh, setting up the environment so that it's not something where they can completely break things. Um, some of the things kind of looking at as we roll out more responsive framework and, and more newer features there is the ability to kind of revert automatically back to the initial state of what it was. So if you put a new header image and you can't remember what the original one was, it's really easy to just one click and go back. Uh, that sort of thing to automate a lot of those things. Our help desk handles some of the really basic stuff where they can submit a ticket and say, hey, I broke this all and then the help desk can kind of redo it. Um, we tell them that the line really there is that it, the content that you put in there is, is your responsibility. So if it's a student blog or something like that, in terms of the affiliation with the university, those kind of things won't have a big BU branding at the top. It'll have actually a disclaimer at the bottom saying this isn't an official university site, depending on um, what their affiliation is. So if it's really an independent blog, that's totally their space. If it's more of a university branding, we might work with marketing communications to say, well, how broken is this? Can the clients fix this themselves? Or is it something that's really urgent? And um, if it's really been broken and it's something that was originally done as a custom work and it needs uh, a significant development effort to go back and fix it, it could be billed as custom development, but it really depends on the case. We try and avoid it from getting to that place in the first place. Some of the bigger sites have a content strategy that goes along with it, and the marketing and communication people help along with that. So, and when the sites are built, they have a full out information architecture put into the site such that it is easily accessible and all the sections of the site really boil up and you can easily discover content. And some of the bigger sites, since they hire uh, writers and or they have uh, hired writers and developers, they sort of continue along uh, from yeah. that trend. So you have, uh, you said you have like 6,000 sites and that's just all on the view campus or within the university? Yeah, we have a few different networks. There's the stuff on www.bu.edu, which is the academic departments and all the official branding sites. And there's sites.bu.edu, which is a mix of labs and kind of independent faculty sites, that sort of thing. Blogs.bu.edu, where all the student and faculty independent blog. So there's several different networks, and that 6,000 is across all of those. Okay, now, how do you handle, like, like for example, if you have like, websites for student organizations, and, and you, you don't know if they are still active and maintained, or how 
how do you know, like, is somebody like watching out for that? Like, if some, someone graduated in 2014 and the site's still there, uh, how is that handled? Yeah, uh, some of the student sites were actually actively in a project where we want to make sure that when they do graduate, that we sort of take their sites off of WordPress and turn them into static sites so we can take away the load from WordPress. Some of the larger sites, we haven't um, actively been monitoring that this site hasn't been updated for too long. Uh, it usually hasn't been a problem. Uh, but I can see that as the networks grow, as the number of sites grow, we sort of have to uh, do that cleanup work. So you mentioned uh, earlier that you were still using Forward, uh, so I'm guessing something is preventing you to update to like more recent versions. Uh, any advice on how to not get into that position or what? <laughs> <laughs> how, how not to DS, huh? Um, the, a lot of the stuff that Inder mentioned, the unit testing and, and that sort of thing, is, is a great way to get there. The ability to say, this is all built entirely according to WordPress standards to be able to say that we're not doing any kind of workarounds to say, hey, a file always lives here, and instead you're doing dynamic references to get style sheet directory ready, that, that sort of stuff uh, would go a really long way. What we've done over the past couple weeks, at least for a specific example, our migration to HTTPS, we've been going in and fixing a lot of those links. So when it says HTTP www.edu, we've been replacing that with the host and the protocol. So it's uh, it's a much more dynamic way of doing it as opposed to those fixed. So a lot of the way to do it is to fix the code that was broken in the first place. Um, and that's the best advice. And usually what happens in upgrades are really long process because we have so many sites and some of the really high traffic sites are in WordPress. We must test those things with the newer versions of WordPress. And we also just don't you know, install the newer versions of WordPress. We also have to sort of uh, make our plugins fit the newer ways that WordPress is doing stuff. So we want to do the diligent work uh, you know, to make uh, our plugins better. And some of them are open source, you know, so we sort of <coughs> owe a responsibility to make those plugins uh, fit WordPress better. It's a really good incentive, though, when we have our open source plugins to keep them current with the current versions of WordPress. It helps us that when it comes to upgrading time, it's um, one less thing to worry about because we know those are already support. I've been told you're one of the larger BuddyPress installations in the world, but when you touched upon BuddyPress, it didn't sound like it was something that you were um, enthused over. Um, That's news to us. We actually took it out of our environment a few years ago. We two, did. two or three years ago, Ron? Yeah. 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 We had it installed for a long time. Folks generally didn't use it that much. I see. Those that used it, do they, they find it useful at all, or just, you just atrophied and died? Atrophied and died. There's a few other universities that do use it, like I think CUNY or SUNY, they have a really huge uh, buddy press installation, so awesome. you, if you want to get in touch, they would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone.